I will be talking about osteosarcoma, new treatments, and research. And hopefully I'll take a slightly different tack, broader, higher 30,000 uh, 30, foot view. And I'll briefly talk about the background of osteosarcoma, um, history of therapy, which I think is somewhat illustrative of the problems, current understanding of the biology of this tumor, clearly a need for new clinical trial design, as well as at the end, I'll talk about some new therapeutic approaches. So similar to what you saw in rhabdomyosarcoma, but perhaps even a little bit more emphatic, osteosarcoma, um, if you look on the left panel, on the left-hand side of your screen, this is the incidence um, of osteosarcoma over decades. And you can see this huge peak in the second decade of life, i.e. in the teenage years. And it starts to go down after that and in the 20s, but still 20, you know, still relatively high and continues to go down. But notice we see osteosarcoma occasionally in, uh, in 80 and 70 year olds. So it's, it really has its peak in the adolescent and early 20s, but it continues to, see, to occur rarely as you age. Um, the second thing on the right-hand panel is if you look at this, if, if where osteosarcoma occurs, it can occur anywhere, but a huge percentage occur uh, around the knee, either in the distal, uh, distal femur or, or, or proximal tibia, or in the shoulder, usually in the proximal humerus. But it can occur anywhere, but mostly the most common site is the knee followed by the shoulder. So uh, the next history of treatment, and I know this is really small, but I wanted to show you a timeline because we've essentially been stuck with our same therapy since 1986, which is, I consider totally unacceptable. So prior to 1970, the treatment of osteosarcoma was a resection of the tumor, usually a radical meaning amputation. Um, and then in the 1970s, some uh, really impressive investigators began to um, try chemotherapy, even though the majority of oncologists said it doesn't work. They persisted. And um, over that decade, by 1980, it led to the first randomized trial because there was a lot, the, the investigators said it worked and others that weren't involved in the treatment said it didn't work. So there was a really first randomized trial looking at whether chemotherapy worked. And that was reported in 1986 and the study ended because it was so effective compared to no treatment at all. So clearly um, we were able to improve the outcome of patients to probably in the range of 10% surviving osteosarcoma to in the range of 60, 65%. Unfortunately, that's where we stand today. Now I don't put on this slide, there were also advances in surgery, but surgery never affected the outcome, the overall outcome of the disease, it just affected um, uh, um, quality of life as we develop ways of sparing the limbs. Um, in the, in, by the 1990s, the standard chemotherapy became methotrexate, adriamycin, and cisplatin, and that continues to be the standard of therapy today. Um, I want to point out that in the 2000s, um, because many of you will have heard of this, there were several studies uh, trying to uh, improve the outcome, studying a drug called MTPPE that's now known as mefamertide. And what was interesting about that study um, is that it was, um, it was reported several times. And overall, the FDA, based on the data, elected not to approve it. The same data was reviewed by the European, the EMA, the European FDA, and it was approved, although it's difficult to get there and it's not covered by all insurance companies. Um, and now today we've had a, a couple of um, interesting outcomes that start to shed some light on maybe making advances in the future. So just quickly to summarize this, it typically occurs around the growth plate, that's the knee and the shoulder. It occurs uh, usually about several years earlier in girls than boys, which I think because girls go through their adolescent growth spurt, usually about two years earlier. What, what the textbooks say is that P53 is mutated in 50% of tumors. What we know now is it's more, almost all tumors have P53 loss. 
Um, and so um, this is really the most common alteration and but it, the reason we missed it is that it's a it's a translocation that we didn't pick up by sequencing. About half have RB mutations. We don't have any accepted prognostic factors other than the presence or absence of metastasis at diagnosis. Although there's some hints now using genetic alterations, in particular, there's a lot of interest in MIC amplification as being a very bad prognostic factor. Um, the most common feature of this tumor is not mutations per se in the DNA coding region, but rather what we call structural abnormalities, that is copy number changes and amplifications and loss. And I'll mention that in a, in a second. Um, I, we can skip, there's a few uh, rare predisposition syndromes that lead to a higher incidence of osteosarcoma. And the most common site of metastasis overwhelmingly is the lung, which is another interesting factor. Uh, and you can see highlighted in red some of the um, alterations that I've listed, including MYC, cyclins, cy um, cyclin-dependent kinases, VEGF, IGF-1 off. So despite the dramatic progress, that all happened uh, between 1970 and 1986, and we've been stuck. Present treatment, as you heard from Dr. Mascarenas, is toxic and complicated. And we have a lot of restrictions in study design because this is such a rare tumor. And we have no way to stratify patients into groups currently based on genetics. So what's our current understanding of the biology? Um, this slide, I don't, it just, uh, what I want to illustrate by this slide is what we really know about osteosarcoma, which is really, stands out compared to all other, other pediatric tumors and compared to all other sarcomas, to be honest, is what we call a turbulent genome. And so what that means is there's incredible genomic complexity. In the upper left-hand box, um, what you see is this, what's called a circus plot. And it just shows, we see everything from translocations to amplifications, to deletions, to a few uh, specific mutations. But the middle left-hand panel shows one of the incredible things that we realize happens fairly frequently in, frequently in osteosarcoma. It's called chromothripsis. And what that essentially means is a chromosome explodes. So up at the top, I think you can see that this as an illustration of a particular chromosome, it doesn't matter which one. And these lines, these blue lines and these red lines mean all across the chromosome, the chromosome is splitting up, amplifying, deleting. It, it's like the chromosome blows up. There are the, the lower left-hand panel showing gene disruptions, meaning there are many translocations where the chromosomes break and reattach. And the red arrow at the very top of that shows specifically how that happens in the P53 gene. And that leads to complete loss of TP53 function. Um, and then there are other um, chromosome gains shown in the upper right panel, as well as losses. And in addition to chromothripsis, there's another really weird thing that happens not uncommonly in osteosarcoma called cartegis, cartegis rather, that is it, um, um, clustered single nucleotide mutations. So that's, you can see across the chromosome, all those little red things at the bottom. So a particular chromosome may have many, many mutations in the same area. And we don't really understand the mechanism of that, but it occurs. So this is a, a turbulent genome, um, which makes it a little difficult to focus on a particular translocation or a particular um, uh, point mutation. But there are a couple of um, things that we now know that we didn't understand. This is a paper published four years ago now uh, from the group in the UK, the Sanger Institute, um, senior author being Peter Campbell, who's been a major, uh, um, uh, provided a lot of information on these uh, tumors. And what they found overall is that in, in, in the series of osteosarcoma tumors they had access to, there was IGF or insulin-like growth factor one uh, receptor amplification in up to 14% of tumors. That's a lot um, because usually we see, you know, maybe 5%, 6%, so fairly common. And this is a paper I, um, I, I show you from, uh, an, again, four years ago, showing a number of tyrosine kinases where the expression is high, 
And note, for example, on the far right, for example, PDGFR receptor alpha is highly expressed in up to 90% of patients. And I'll come back to that because it looks like this may be a target that we're beginning to see some fruit in, in targeting. So I wanna point out another uh, thing, which is that, um, that these, we really need new clinical trial design. And I'm gonna try to illustrate that in two slides that I don't expect you, you know, th this is histology. So you see these pink, these very bright pink areas, this is bone and the bluer sort of um, smaller blue areas are the osteosarcoma tumor invading bone. And so I want you to see what this looks like because when we treat patients with chemotherapy and they do extraordinarily well, this slide shows what you're left with. So the pink area is still left because we don't get rid of bone. Bone is mineral, as you know, it's basically calcium hydroxyapatite. But these, uh, the, the lighter pink in between that bone really are the ghost of the cells here that are the bluish cells here, they disappear. But what you can imagine is the tumor doesn't shrink because you've got basically concrete. So the standard um, measure of a active therapy, chemotherapy is tumor shrinkage. But we don't see tumor shrinkage when the tumor cells are surrounded by concrete. And so um, a, a number of investigators, this was really the senior author of this paper that came out again five years ago, was Katie Janeway and some people in her group. They looked at phase two studies. So these were studies over the you know, 10, 12 years, dozens of studies where we were trying to find new active drugs to help us get over this hump of 65%. And what she found was all of our phase two studies, many phase two studies had failed. Um, and what she began to look at, what the, what the investigators looked at was that um, we really, instead of looking for resist criteria, which is tumor shrinkage, maybe we should look at uh, event-free survival, meaning how long does it take for the tumor to progress? Because if we can prolong the time to progression, eventually we hope that would lead to prolongation of survival. And she, what she showed is that in patients with measurable tumor in osteosarcoma, if you look at four months in a phase two study, there were only 12% of patients that hadn't progressed after four months. So this tells us we should be looking and being able to assess uh, uh, various drugs at a very short interval so we can cycle through drugs and make our, uh, our marker for success. If we can prolong event-free survival beyond four months, significantly above 12%, that may be a indication of, of um, activity and that can be tested in larger studies. Similarly, for patients who have had, let's say their pulmonary metastases resected, if she looked at that cohort of patients, um, again, event-free survival um, was only 20% at 12 months. This is in patients who have no measurable disease. So again, we could study those patients, which currently in many, in many uh, tumor types, you can't study a patient with no measurable disease, but we know that only 20% of patients um, with no measurable disease are gonna have uh, no progression at a year. So um, on the left, these cohort one and cohort two, these are the recommended uh, way, the recommended study design. And it's, it's, I will show you, it's beginning to bear some fruit, although we have a long way to go um, to continue to um, identify and really find active drugs that are gonna overall improve survival. Um, so I, I just, I'm gonna illustrate that, but I wanna throw in one more thing, which is I, I believe that um, first of all, dogs get osteosarcoma much more frequently than, than patients. I, I forgot to mention on the first slide, there's roughly five, 600 cases a year of osteosarcoma in the United States. So it's clearly a rare tumor. So we're limited in patients we can study. Canines, uh, usually large breed dogs, develop osteosarcoma. And we're beginning to see 
in some ways how we can integrate taking a drug um, that has promise, trying to refine its use in a dog with um, spontaneous osteosarcoma and then move it into the clinic. Um, and so in the last five, 10 minutes, I'm going to focus on new treatment approaches. And I'm going to start with immunotherapy because that's sort of the hot topic and everyone, you know, I, I man a hotline for the Osteosarcoma Institute and everyone is hoping, um, you know, we can try immunotherapy and we have a little ways to go, but I'm relatively optimistic and end with a little discussion on targeted therapy. And now back to the dogs. So um, this was study. This was a study done that led to uh, merfamatide, merfamatide to be um, studied in humans. And this was first studied in dogs with osteosarcoma. And um, Greg McEwen, um, who has since passed away, was really instrumental in developing this um, um, in dogs. And what he was able to show that's highlighted in that red square is that um, the median survival in dogs with osteosarcoma was 22, 222 days for dogs that got the MTPPE or, um, or um, mefamertide and was 77 days for dogs that didn't. So clearly seemed to have some activity. And that led to a study and which I talked about, which has met with limited success. There are people that feel there are patients that will respond to it. Like I said, it's not approved in this country. The FDA recommended a repeat study, but unfortunately the company wouldn't make it available for another study, but it is um, available uh, in some countries in the, um, in the EU. But if you go back, I'm a big fan of history teaching us something. If you go back, there's something called Coley's toxin. Coley, uh, Coley uh, was the head of um, uh, bone tumors at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And he began to study what um, was a killed toxin that he got from streptopiogenes and serratia, marcescens, which are two bacteria, um, and was ejecting patients with various sarcomas starting at the turn of the 20th century in the early 1900s. And, um, and, and many sarcoma patients were reported to respond, and many of those included osteosarcoma. And this continued to be studied uh, through the 1970s when the FDA was finally, um, and the FDA wasn't even found, uh, op, didn't even exist in the early 20th century. So by the 1970s, they shut it down. So there was a lot of toxicity. Some patients actually died from the toxicity, but there were clearly tumor regressions associated with fever that seemed to be induced by these toxins. So some smoke suggesting that if you get the immune system to get activated in the right circumstances, it can have an impact on the um, on, on, on outcome of osteosarcoma. And there was another study in, in the vet, veterinary oncology group, again, using dogs, showing that dogs that had post-operative infections after an amputation tended to have prolonged survival, again, suggesting that somehow a, 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 an inflammatory response helped overall outcome. Um, so that, you know, we can leave merfamertide because it's a very controversial subject. Suffice it to say, it, it's not a home run and it hasn't had a major impact on overall survival. But people are working really hard to develop immunotherapy. Um, there's a study now using what's called LM HER2. So we know HER2 is a expressed in osteosarcoma, and um, this is a group using Listeria monocytogenes to vaccinate. And again, they saw some activity in in um, in dogs, and so now there's a, a, a an ongoing study um, to look at disease control in patients with HER2 expressing completely resected osteosarcoma compared to historical controls. I've not seen the outcome of this study. Um, I know they've had some issues, but it is ongoing. Now, if you're gonna talk about immunotherapy, I just wanna point out that one of the things we've learned a lot about in the last five, six years is that it's not just the tumor cells. So the tumor exists in this incredible microenvironment. And in osteosarcoma, it's really important because you have to get through concrete, you have to get through calcium, and there are endothelial cells, and there are fibroblasts, 
and, and they all talk to each other. And so one of the things we probably have to learn more about in osteosarcoma is how we can make that microenvironment allow immune cells to get into the tumor. And there's a lot of work going on now, which I hope will lead to better outcomes as we continue to try to advance immunotherapy. I, I want to end with some ongoing studies. I just pulled these off of um, um, you know, the online um, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. So, and these are, several of these are really trying to use immunotherapy, although several others are trying to use targeted therapy. So this is a study um, being run by Katie Janeway, whom I mentioned previously at Dana-Farber. And she's um, using Alaparib, which is a PARP1 inhibitor, with another drug called uh, Seralacertin. So one of the reasons the PARP inhibitors have found, uh, people are interested, is there are some investigators have found a BRCA-like signature, and we know that PAR PARP inhibitors work well in people with BRCA mutations. So this PARP-like signature has made people interested in trying this. So far, it hasn't worked. But she's combining it with another drug, that, and PARP affects DNA repair. And so this other drug, Seralacertib, uh, is also a DNA repair inhibitor. So maybe by combining them, um, we could see a better outcome. And this study is ongoing. There's no results available yet. This is a um, antibody drug conjugate. Again, I mentioned HER2. This is a, a drug called trastuzumab deruxatecan. So TCAN sounds like aranatecan or topotecan. It's another topo-1 inhibitor, but it's trying to deliver the topo-1 inhibitor into osteosarcoma by using the HER2 antibody to deliver it and get it to the tumor better than just trying to give it IV. That's a study that's ongoing um, and still, you know, just got updated in August. We don't have results yet. And um, then there's another study using a PD-1 inhibitor called PD PDL-1 inhib PD-1 inhibitor called Dervalumab. You know, PD-1 inhibitors are what we call immune checkpoint inhibitors, but it's and, and they haven't worked so far in osteosarcoma. But they're combining it with another drug called Alecplumab, and Alecplumab is a drug that inhibits the inhibition of immune cells, especially uh, uh, T cells. And so the idea is if you activate, um, the, if you inhibit, there's something called adenosine, it comes from ATP, and this drug converts, inhibits the conversion to adenosine, and adenosine inhibits the function of T cells. So they're now using a checkpoint inhibitor with an inhibitor um, of, uh, with an activator of T cells. And so this study just got underway, as you can see, and again, we don't have results. I wanna just end with targeted therapy. And I'm optimistic because there were two randomized double-blind phase two studies in metastatic osteosarcoma looking at a drug called regorafenib. And it's interesting to me because regorafenib is a multi-kinase inhibit, inhibitor that inhibits, among other things, PDGFR. Um, and so very interesting because you could see how commonly PDGFR was overexpressed. Um, and this study met the, crack, the endpoint, uh, which demonstrated, this is in the uh, enclosed box, patients um, with progressive metastatic osteosarcoma. So it inhibited progression of disease above um, the patients who did not. This was a separate study done in France, very similar. It had more adults with osteosarcoma. The first study was a younger patient population. But again, it demonstrated clinically meaningful anti-tumor activity with recurrent progressive metastatic osteosarcoma after failure. Uh, and their recommendation is it should be evaluated in the future. And so I think we have two randomized studies that showed um, the, the, the ability of this drug to inhibit progression-free survival using these new um, clinical trial designs. And now we're trying to figure out how we can combine those. And there are various studies on the verge of being open. One of them, I know that Dr. Mascarenas is involved in with a combination with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. So just to conclude, um, 
I think the identification of molecular alterations in specific sarcoma subtypes is leading to novel therapeutic options. And I think we can now include osteosarcoma in that, but we need uh, to learn a lot more. It is likely that as with chemotherapy, combinations of targeted agents or, or immune agents will be necessary. So we can't just use one targeted agent in the vast majority of cases and how we incorporate that either with chemotherapy or immunotherapy remains to be worked out. And targeting rare subtypes of rare tumors will require incredible um, both collaboration and novel design. So for example, if MYC amplification uh, requires uh, to be treated differently, now you're talking about a small percentage of a rare tumor. How are we gonna study that in a reasonable period of time? So I'll end, this is my dream. Um, this is a, a, you know, the idea is if we can take a patient's tumor, um, put it into a mouse model called a PDX, study the drug sensitivity there, also do full sequencing um, and, and come up with some alterations. Um, and then we can also, I didn't have time to talk about, monitor patients with um, uh, circulating cell-free DNA and also understand clonal um, evolution. I hope this will move the field forward. And I think we're gonna see a lot in the next decade. So I'm optimistic with that. Um, we have a lot of work to be done. Um, we have to advance the conduct of rationally based combination trials, integrate the, um, and leverage the use of advanced biomedical technologies, op opti optimize the use of information technology and standardize biospecimen collection so we can do the things I dream of doing. And we have to work closely with industry to facilitate IP issues. We need to get drugs to kids sooner. With that, I will end and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Hellman. Um, we do have time for questions. We're right on time. And I see there are a couple of questions in the queue. Okay, so yes, excellent talk. Very, very informative. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, so regarding your comments needing new clinical trial designs, could you yeah. say a little bit how basket, umbrella, and platform trials could or are used in osteosarcoma trials? Yeah, well, so, you know, I think umbrella trials or platform trials are useful if there's a, if, if you're studying a, um, a drug that inhibits, let's say, um, CDK4, and you have a patient with osteosarcoma that has a CDK4 inhibitor and you can put them on that after they failed standard therapy. Yes, they get entered on those, those uh, studies. Unfortunately, we're talking about, you know, 5% of patients. And so um, to really get enough numbers to get that answered quickly in an umbrella study or platform study, to get enough osteo patients where we would know quickly if a patient has a CDK4 uh, um, alteration, um, should we treat that patient with a CDK4-6 inhibitor? It's gonna take a while to sort it out, but I'm all for trying um, because we know we need to, so I think we need to use every platform we can to try novel clinical trial design. So if I had a patient with an alteration and they were available and was available to try a CDK4-6 inhibitor on one of those studies, I would consider it talk with the patient and see if they were interested. Um, so I know that there's the, I, I think there is a pediatric match, but I don't know how, uh, what the status of that is. Is, is that ongoing or it's been halted or? Uh, I think they've had early report. Leo, are you going to chime in? Do you have any, you know, Leo may know, you know, they've reported some of the outcomes. There, there seemed, the problem has been that patients that get on these studies, many of them, you find the thing by the time you get access to the drug, they've already progressed. So it's been really hard to study, um, but there have been some indications that some patients that have a targeted uh, mutation, a mutation that is uh, uh, targeted by a specific therapy, it could benefit them. And um, also an earlier speaker recommended orthopedic us uh, oncologists be engaged in evaluating emergent bone tumors and existing cancer patients to evaluate these tumors. Thoughts? 
Couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, I didn't have time. You can see I barely finished in the in the 30 minutes. But you know, osteosarcoma is a multimodality um, game, or not game, um, uh, but a multimodality uh, therapeutic approach. We never, ever, I would never start treating a patient without having a orthopedic oncologist engaged in the very beginning because they need to see what the tumor looks like before we start treating it. And so, you know, and I didn't want to shortchange the incredible advances that orthopedic surgeons, orthopedic oncologists have made in working with the chemotherapy, chemotherapists like me and Leo um, to work together. Um, and we need to work very closely with a, a very experienced orthopedic oncologist. And uh, my recommendation when I get calls is if you're in a center that doesn't have an experienced orthopedic oncologist with osteosarcoma, find one, because that is critical to working uh, to cure patients. And um, does, uh, Dr. Mascarenas, you put in the chat that, um, that you, um, uh, that you have that trial open, the um, regorafenib and the bolumab. Oh, it's it open at your site already? Yeah, it's, um, it, it is going to be opened in 13 sites across the country. Uh, two sites are already opened, uh, Children's Hospital Los Angeles and um, the Health Science Center in Oregon, Portland are open already. Um, mm -hmm. And it's building on the experience of the two randomized trials, which showed an advantage uh, for survival in patients who were treated with regorafenib. And so our hope is by adding on a checkpoint inhibitor to take advantage of the uh, genomic uh, sort of complexity of osteosarcoma together with regorafenib may benefit patients and uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's open to accrual and may be open soon at many centers uh, with geographic location of convenience around the country. Let me add one thing, because Leo knows I was throwing him a phone. I worked very hard with Leo when I was at CHLA and with the sponsors to get this study open. One of the reasons I'm, I'm interested and optimistic is that one of the other uh, targets of regorafinib is VEGF. And there's mounting evidence that by altering VEGF in the tumor microenvironment, you can get more T cells and you can't get an immune response if you can't get the T cells to the tumor. So it may be that there's added benefit by having inhibition of VEGF and then getting a checkpoint inhibitor. We got a long ways to go. We still don't know if a checkpoint inhibitor is gonna add anything, but it's worth trying. Um, and so I'm very excited about this study. I'm excited about it too. We're going to be, we were um, at University of Miami, uh, we were selected as one of the sites. So we're excited. We're working diligently to get that trial open. So that, that definitely very much. is promising. <laughs> um, and then uh, there was a question or comment about the idea of the animals um, with osteosarcoma. So are you currently working with animals, um, dog trials or anything? Or we are the Osteosarcoma Institute um, has on its board of directors, a card carrying um, um, veterinary oncologist and a former postdoc and colleague of mine for many, many years. And so we are very interested in how and what's the right question to ask where we could gain something by testing a new treatment in a dog before we bring it into patients so that we minimize the chance of failure. And we have to have the right question. We have to know that the drug has similar pharmacokinetics than as it does in humans, and we have to be able to measure that. But we believe that using, and one of the advantages of a dog with osteosarcoma is unlike uh, laboratory models, these spontaneously occur. So spontaneous cancer is different than a cancer you implant or a genetically engineered mouse model, um, which have these tumors from day one. Because if the tumor develops spontaneously, the immune system recognizes it in a totally different way. And so we're very interested. We need to define the right drug and the right questions to ask because it's more expensive than to study in mice. But I think with the right question, it will help us a lot. And we are very engaged in figuring out how to do that. Well, I want to thank you both. You excellent. It, this is the first time um, this, you know, this is our 
third annual or fourth annual? Fourth. Wait. Fourth annual. I don't know where fourth. the time goes. This <laughs> is our fourth annual sarcoma exchange, and we haven't had um, pediatric um, cancers really addressed, and we haven't had pediatric oncologists um, give lectures. So this has really been very enlightening. We, we really appreciate it, and um, and want to thank you for all your answers to the audience. Um, and hopefully we'll see, I won't see you at CTOS, but hopefully maybe ASCO or something uh, soon. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully we'll see you soon live in person. And it's, uh, Dr. DeMato, could I just add a comment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting us to speak. I, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, all the children's oncology group trials are actually open to those less than 50 years of age through CTSU. So it doesn't necessarily need to be just solely in the pediatric age group. And so many cancer centers, which actually have a pediatric program, uh, there should be access to all the trials uh, in sarcomas conducted by the children's oncology group. Thank you. That's in, in fact, uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, a new trial for stage four clinical group for rhabdomyosarcoma is opening um, and it's called ARST 2031, 2031. And uh, we are very excited about that randomized trial because it's, uh, we are adding vinerylbean, which is very active to rhabdomyosarcoma uh, to, um, for newly diagnosed patients for the very first time up front. And it's less, uh, much less neurotoxic than vincristine. So uh, there's potentially uh, benefit even from the toxicity aspects to adults participating in that trial. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Hellman, Dr. Mascarenas, and again, Dr. Diamato for being our question fielding MC here. <laughs> we 